Welcome to the last keynote session of this two-day policy forum. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the uh, last keynote speaker, which is Lefteris uh, Heretakis. Lefteris Heretakis, uh, researcher and practitioner in design with an international experience. Uh, from the UK to Turkey and now in uh, Alicante, Spain, uh, always coupling theoretical reflections uh, with practical actions. I think this is a bit uh, no? the specific uh, contribution, point of view, angle that uh, uh, Lefteris can uh, present to us today and the topic that was agreed has to do with the connection between education and design so the floor is yours and please thank you. surprise us thank you so much thank you thank you well, hello everybody welcome um, just some uh, housekeeping um, I put my hashtag on there and the first ha the first uh, hashtag is the forum and the second is the landscapes event so, uh, my name is Lefteris, and uh, I've been painting for a long time. Uh, so I've been in the arts for a long time. And uh, I've also tried to learn some music from, from an early age. So today we're going to talk about design education and we're going to try and get some framework for the future because we've heard a lot about design as such. But we have not heard so much on the subject of design education, which is a kind of a prerequisite in a sense, and it's, uh, it has a very long tradition. So, just to clarify, um, my background is in visual communication design, from graphics to illustration to photography to branding uh, to motion graphics. Uh, so it's visual communication design. So any set of conclusions uh, can be ported into other areas, but also with caution. Okay, so we're, we're talking about visual communication in the art school environment. And uh, the, the information that you're going to be given uh, has been developed over a 10 year period in the following countries, uh, and looking from the perspective of three stakeholders, the students, the lecturers, and the industry, because I'm very much interested in my practice uh, in that relationship. Because it's not just design education, it's not something that's just about one stakeholder. It's primarily for the students, okay, secondly for the lecturers, but also it's, the, the aim is to create designers and that also has to involve the industry. So this is the, um, the perspective of the research, the, the ongoing research that uh, is happening uh, and, ha and has been happening in order to connect the dots about something that uh, has slightly been disconnected, but we'll get more about that in the First, start with a quote uh, from, from Daniel Priestley. Uh, our best thinking five years ago is our baggage today. So we have to really sort of look at what is happening now, okay, and reevaluate what we're doing. And so to make sure that we're all on the same page, I'm going to start with some definitions because. Uh, Things can be different to, to each of us, but it's good if we, if we get the definition. So my favorite definition of design is by Master Paul Rand. Okay. Design is the method of putting form and content together. Uh, and 
design, this country's culture. Yeah? So there, we, we must always remember the link. Don't forget that there's a link in the arts, and a lot of the, uh, so a lot of the solutions we're looking for in design can be found in the arts. Traditionally, uh, designers have always looked to the arts for inspiration. Arts has always been ahead. It's only in the recent, let's say, couple of decades where we have a, a fusion of movements, a fusion of movements that things have become more interchangeable and multidisciplinary. And uh, just, just a couple of uh, definitions of design education. Yeah. Theory and application, design of product services and environments. So, uh, about design education, uh, we're, we're talking about a kind of, of, of uh, teaching that has a theoretical background, of course, but also uh, when we're teaching designers, we're talking about the craft, we're talking about the doing. So, there is, there is uh, more doing and, and, a, and a smaller percentage of, of theory. So I just wanted to uh, get around UK art schools and international art schools, uh, just to give you a little bit of a uh, of a journey. Yeah, how was design taught? So how did one become a painter uh, in the uh, 1600s? And they just went to a painter and they started grinding their their colors. Yeah, and about five or six, seven years later, they were a fully fledged painter. It was an apprenticeship. It was a, a real, a genuine apprenticeship. So design education started in the apprenticeships and in the guilds. But in order to uh, become a, a painter, a furniture maker, a sculptor, one would always find a master to 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 learn to learn to learn from, and. Um, of course, there's a journey of uh, how design education has changed. Uh, and there are some stages, for example, uh, mass production, yeah, the also and also the introduction of uh, color color uh, lithography and, and color and movable type. And I've just put certain schools that really influenced. Uh, design education, and of course there are many, 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 many other schools, yeah, there are hundreds of amazing schools that have influenced design education, but uh, I've, I've, put, I've put some here. Uh, I personally, um, I'm very much inspired by John Ruskin and his principles. Last year we celebrated 200 years from his birth, and I, I feel that he is a very, very much contemporary uh, philosopher that we need to be looking at in terms of uh, design and design education. Uh, it, it's, it almost seems to me that the arts and crafts and the pre raphaelite movement is more relevant today than at the time it was written. It was all, it's almost for me, it's, it has been written for today. Uh, so there, there has been a continuation of design education uh, methodology uh, and, and practice it was almost been uh, very very similar until the the introduction of, of, of desktop publishing okay so around the 80s uh, we were able to create uh, publishing and typography and drawings on the computer and at, at that time, it was something fantastic, and it is something fantastic. Uh, but at the time, people didn't know what to do with that. So we got uh, Page Maker or Quark or Illustrator, and at the same time, a lot of uh, presses, a lot of movable type, hot metal type, were just binned or recycled. The art college started throwing away uh, the the older methodology and just concentrating on the digital. And it's only recently 
that we are going back toward the synthesis of that. So it's only recently that we are reappreciating and redefining hot metal type, movable type, uh, litho, screen printing, all the traditional methodology that we need to combine with digital. Uh, so for me, the dialogue between uh, the analog and the digital is, is fundamental. And it's where uh, it's where it's, it's where it's at. But in order to use both, in order to use both, uh, we have uh, we need to be teaching skills and abilities. Okay, and this is something, of course, quite quite challenging in this generation of very short attention spans. But at the same time, we need to be having skills and abilities that will carry students and graduates through. And, and so they have something to trade, something to, an ability to be able to be, to, to exchange for employment. So traditionally, in to create, to, to talk about one of the, one of the challenges, because they were talking many about many challenges, um, in, in, the, in the teaching side, there were three stakeholders. Okay, you had the art design historians, the technicians, and the arts and the designers that were teaching. So students were learning from three different kinds of educators. In fact, many times technicians could offer advice that moved somebody much more forward than anybody else. I've experienced that personally, and it is through technicians that a lot of the really practical uh, application of design uh, has been traditionally taught. Now, in certain countries, uh, we saw that technicians were uh, made redundant from art schools, and arts and designers had to are being forced to move to a more uh, theoretical, scientific uh, area, being judged by uh, more theoretical and scientific criteria rather than the criteria of art and design schools, art and design education. So this is one of the areas that we need to look at okay, as far as design education is concerned. Uh, we need to recreate the balance there. This is probably the most important slide um, in regard to policy, okay? And how can policy be, uh, what are the areas that we will be looking at for policy? So uh, we're looking at three stages of the student journey. We're looking at the, the stages before the art school, uh, preparation of the student, of the candidate, the selection process, which is extremely important, and that holds many, many keys. And, and the education from early years. Okay, because for me, most of the problems that we are facing as educators at the, in, at the higher education university level are to be found in the early years. So we need to look at that journey uh, from the early years into uh, how the, the, the students reach the preparation stage and how they are selected. And the selection process is something very key, which we'll be talking about a bit later on, about certain schools that have a very lax selection process and other schools that have a very strict selection process. And how does that change things? Okay. Now, during their education, uh, policy can look at curriculum, teaching and learning, apprenticeships, resources. Art and design education is something very expensive. It's disproportionately expensive to any other kind of education because usually in many subjects you have a great number of students in a room and it's a lecture-based process, whereas the process of design education is a one-to-one -one process with a lot of physical uh, material like cameras, printmaking areas, photography areas, studios, 
centers, it's, it's quite expensive. And in the, in the, recent, in the recent present, not this, the, the resources um, has become a problem. And then we look at the stage that's after the art school. Uh, employability, which is of course needs to be looked at, employability we need to look at you know, in the other, all the other stages. The trajectory of the students and transferable skills. Uh, one of my students, for example, after some years, uh, was able to uh, design the most successful pub at the north of England. So, but he was used his design skills. It is very, very important that certain uh, students that have gone through the design education process, if they have really taken it seriously, they can use it to design their life in a, in a very uh, specific way. So, for those for those that want to of us that of course we want to look at more in, in, in terms of policy, I would really recommend that we look at these three areas as because that's where the keys are to find solutions for policy on design education. So my first challenge, I started teaching uh, about about eleven years ago. Um, and very, very shortly, I realized that even though uh, my students and I were looking at the same piece of design, we were not seeing the same piece of design. And so uh, my investigation started, uh, and I remembered a very specific kind of advanced observation drawing I was taught as a student, and that was something that I put quite a bit of emphasis on, uh, with certain limitations, of course, <coughs> that I wasn't always able to, to hold the class. So, again, looking at the scene in design education. Another challenge is that in many countries, uh, contact time is about a fifth of what it used to be. Design education, traditionally, <coughs> was a 95 plus process, it was like going to work. You were studying and working for a full day or more. And now in many, in many art schools around the world and universities, the contact time has been reduced uh, greatly. And there are questions of, of how that can be corrected, how that can be bridged. It varies greatly and that's why Design education is something that varies greatly from country to country. Uh, certain countries have amazing schools, and we need to look at what makes these schools amazing. Uh, it's usually contact time and certain other things that we'll be talking about further on. So, uh, this is going to I'm going to present some, some uh, polarization, some uh, polar opposites, so I don't want anybody to get upset. Uh, <laughs> but it's just for the sake of discussion. Okay, and this is something that, uh, yeah, the, 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 the two extremes, if you like. Okay. The two extremes, um, we have schools that come from more of a private uh, area. And because they come from a private perspective, they have to uh, uh, water down their selection criteria and take on more students. Okay, and what that produces. And we have the public schools in many countries, the free schools. Uh, have a very strict selection process, and what that produces. And, but each in each of the two, let's say, extremes, there are strengths and weaknesses. Okay, for example, in many government schools around the world, which are completely free, uh, lecturers there have not had any any experience in real life. So in that way, they cannot help the students very much. They can give some 
fantastic teaching from our drawing and techniques and blah, 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 okay. But we cannot help students from an employability perspective. Uh, on the, the, and also there is, a, there is a very rigid selection process for the staff. And also so that means that not all, not the best designers go to the government school. The best designers tend to be in the private school. So you have this, um, you have this paradox that the best, the best uh, students rarely get to see the best teachers because the best students have been selected from a very strict selection process in the government school. But usually the best teachers can go in the private school because they're allowed to have more freedom, they're allowed to uh, exercise their, their, uh, their employment, their, their identity as designers. So um, you have paradox. Also, the government schools do have uh, access to greater funding. They're more flexible. They can organize more events. But again, there are limitations in each method. And there's an interesting middle ground uh, that certain countries have. Uh, again, this is another uh, area that needs to be looked at. So, however, in my experience, from both schools, the best students always, always come up. The 10% always comes up. So, no matter what the education system, if somebody wants to learn, because Design education ultimately is a uh, self-teaching. Um, they do, and so the students take responsibility for their learning, do really well. But what happens with the other ninety percent? Are we prepared to continue with this, or should all graduates be at a certain level? And this is where uh, I can take it to you if you want. It's, it's an interesting area. I'm going to bring it up. Uh, before I give you my, some of my recommendations. Yeah. So would anybody want to talk about this? Or any of the other issues that have been raised so far? Hi, um, I always have something to say. If I have something to say, I'll say it. Um, when I was in Germany, I had my agency, and I had the good fortune of working with the um, Heinrich Heine University, uh, specifically in marketing and design. Um, the professor I worked with was a wonderful character, very amicable, a great teacher, but he had his limitations. The university is funded well, and I noticed in the workshops we were doing within my own offices for agency, <clears throat> the frustration of the students. And my take on it was that th the systems you're showing are self-perpetuating. The students were continually trying to break out of the mold that the professor was putting them in. Yeah. And I was encouraging them to break out, and he was encouraging me to help them break out because he realized he himself was in the zoo, if you like, Brilliant. in his Brilliant. cage. Brilliant. Um, so I think that is a topic that needs to be addressed, mm -hmm. the self Okay, so this is a uh, this has been a, a very short review. There's a lot more in each in each area, but, but I've given you the uh, the areas, and and I just want to finish with my recommendation. Okay, uh, so we need to be learning swimming in, in the swimming pool. Yeah? Anybody that's learning swimming from books is going to drown. And we can stop that because design education is being, um, is being shoved in an area where students are learning swimming from books. And they have five PhDs on swimming, but it's from books. So uh, that, is, that, is a, that is a big issue. Yeah? So, we need to place the student and the practice at the heart of the curriculum. In certain countries, we must immediately bring back technicians and increase contribution of the industry. 
Yeah, recently I have uh, started a podcast called Design Education Talks. And uh, the industry has, is telling me that the involvement in education is less, has been reduced, so we have more involvement, not less. We need to look at lectures on a practitioner basis, on how, how they are successful as a practitioner. Uh, right. The most success, successful art schools in the world, uh, namely Poland and Lithuania, are countries that come to mind. And of course, Spain and France and fantastic schools. Yeah? But they start from art. They start from art and continue to design. Only the most rigid schools, because if you're, not, if you're talking about design, you're just talking about your art. The, the body is art. The art is design. You cannot separate art from design. So we must start from art. We must start educating uh, students as artists and then taking them into design. Some schools forget to do that, of course. <laughs> the ones that have the fantastic art education neglect to take them to the design, but that's another uh, topic. Uh, we've got to strengthen skills and abilities in the curriculum, including drawing, including uh, observational skills. And link practice uh, with art and design history, because usually students have a very weak idea of history, so that needs to be linked to the practice. And of course, I mean, I'm repeating myself: strengths and apprenticeships and links with the industry. Thank you so much.
changed dramatically from country, from country to country. And that's another thing that's quite unique about Zen education, that is, it doesn't exist in any other practice so much, in, in that great degree, how much it varies. Uh, there's no real consensus. So it's a, what I've said is a broad brush. Uh, if you want to go more specific, then we have to talk about a specific country. Yeah. But even teaching methodologies, of course, is uh, uh, I, I, I've been educated in an uh, architecture school, and there was no methodology. I just they, I was taught by imitation and inspiration. Mm -hmm. Look at uh, the, you know Otto Wagner, uh, and then do the same, or you know do similar things. Uh, and when and, and I had a problem that when talking with some of my teachers, some of which are quite well known, uh, and they heard about uh, that I was then interested in methodology, they jump back on the chair and say, why do you need the methodology in design? So it, it, it is still a problem to say that design, uh, I mean, it's still, still a problem in some schools to say that design meet, and art, especially art, needs methodology. There is no method for art, it's inspiration, they say. I, I may not agree with this, I, I do not agree with this. But, uh, inspiration exists, but it must find you working. It must find you working. It is about the work. And if you develop your own logic in the work. Uh, but of course you need a methodology. But you can teach methodology. Of course you can. Of course you can. Of course you can. But, but it's also up to the, it's kind of a self-learning app from, from, from a certain point onwards. It's a, it's a self-learning. Uh, high uh, level or high 
highly educated or challenged to become highly educated designers, for me, it is part of this broader mm -hmm. thing. Uh, with an extra comment, that is my, my contribution to this talk, this kind of disconnect between education and profession hides another disconnect that is related to the fact that uh, in the old good times before globalization, on average, the industrialized countries especially could uh, uh, be fulfilled with the um, skills of the people coming out of secondary education. Because those were enough for the old model of industrial setup, of factory of, of, of the past, instead of factory of the future. So at, at that time, it was easier to say, okay, 